QSO Today, Episode 432, Mark Persons, W0MH. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest amateur radios and accessories for your ham radio station, and by Nuts and Volts Magazine. The next QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo returns on March 24, 2023, and I need your help. From the survey that we did after the last expo, we learned that we have excellent presentations that are enjoyed by older hams with many years in the hobby. However, from the same survey, it was not obvious that most of the presentations offered in the expo could be applied to new technician licensees as well as the rest of us. The message that we want to convey for the next expo is that any of the presentations regarding technology, rigs, operating modes, building projects can be enjoyed by technician class licensees with the new ham radio license. The cheap Chinese handheld radio on the local repeater is one of many options available, and the goal of the next expo is to demonstrate these opportunities to new licensees and to make getting help to get on the air in any of these modes easy and fun. Unlike the novice license that many of us used to enter the hobby, where we only were allowed to operate CW in three bands, the technician class license is an, as an entry point into amateur radio has a huge opportunity to try many different bands and operating modes. My goal is to allow these new licensees to enjoy the technician class license as an opportunity to grow in ham radio before upgrading the license to higher levels. Please click on the banner in this week's show notes page that says Make a Presentation at the Expo, or go to the Expo website by clicking on the Expo links in the QSO Today website. I created a diagram with some ideas about technician class options on the application page. You may have an idea that there is even more that I have not yet thought of. I welcome your ideas and presentation applications. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth, amateur call sign 4Z1UG, where I demonstrate the diversity and relevance of the amateur radio hobby and its impact on society by interviewing ham radio operators, many of whom played vital roles in shaping our technology through the amateur radio hobby. And while many people might say, ham radio, do people still do that? This podcast demonstrates through in-depth interviews just how amazing, diverse, and dynamic the amateur radio hobby continues to be. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo is up on YouTube once again. I'm posting the presentations from the last expo in September for everyone to watch. I have over 370 total presentations from five expos and posting them a few a day. Please help me out by subscribing to the channel. It is very important as a way to get the word out about the Expo and the whole QSO Today project. Mark Persons, W0MH, was a recent speaker at the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo, where he presented How to Build a Broadcast Engineer's Version of an HF Amateur Radio Station, detailing his home ham radio shack installation meeting broadcast standards. Broadcast radio ran in Mark's family, and he spent a long and successful career as a broadcast engineer, contributing tens of articles to professional and amateur radio publications, and is the consummate radio mentor, volunteer, and ham radio Elmer. W0MH is my QSO today. W0MH, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, Mark? 4Z1UG, it's Mark, W0MH. I'm here. Mark, thanks so much for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. I just want to point out that Mark was a speaker at the last QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo, where he spoke on how to build a broadcast engineer's version of an HF amateur radio station. That presentation is up on our YouTube channel, and I hope that everybody gets a chance to see it. It appears to be relatively popular compared to the other videos that are up there, so I hope that you'll have a chance to see it. Mark, it's nice to catch up with you. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? Oh my gosh. Well, probably about age 10. I remember being absolutely enamored by shortwave stations coming in from Europe into northern Minnesota. It was more than just local radio stations, so that led me to being a shortwave listener Along the way, I, I think my first Heath kit was a, was a CR1, the Crystal Radio. Of course, I could only hear the local radio station on that. Then I moved over to the Heath kit uh, AR3, and this is kit building. It's not something you buy from a store other than you buy the kit and you put it together. 
at age 10, you're listening to shortwave stations come in. Now, was this on the family radio? Did you have like a tabletop or console radio that had a shortwave band in it? This was a console radio that actually just had a great image. It was big. It was as big as I was. And and the sound coming out of it from radio stations in France and, and all over just just really excited me to learn that, gosh, I could hear things from the other side of the world. And was that how your family spent their evenings, was listening to the radio? Or was that in another room while the new family television was running at the same time? Well, the the story, my father started as a radio broadcast engineer back in 1926. And at the time when I discovered shortwave radio, our family owned and ran W-E-L-Y in Ely, Minnesota. And that was about the time when I started turning the dials on broadcast transmitters very carefully to see if I could get them to work better. And I've been doing it ever since. Okay, so your father was a broadcast engineer, one of the first, it sounds to me, because this was like just after World War I, the Navy had released the frequencies to broadcast and to the amateur services and stuff. And so you guys were in the radio business. Was he an amateur radio operator? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, back then, all, I repeat, all radio broadcast engineers were hams. That was just normal. And, of course, that was even before television. But 1926 is when he started. The radio industry is celebrating its 100th anniversary here in 2022. Uh, and he had been a listener to WEBC in Duluth for several years, actually from the start of broadcasting, until he was old enough to go to Duluth and apply for a job and work at WEBC. He became the corporate uh, engineer after a while, and then the story just goes on from there. Do you have any idea what kind of training he might have had in those days, or what kind of training was available for radio engineers in those days? As he tells it in his book, he couldn't even find a book telling him how to be a broadcast engineer. He just had to start at the beginning, go there, and learn it there were books on how to be a shipboard operator, that kind of thing. So he had one of those licenses. But broadcasting was just starting at the time. So he just had to pick it up a piece at a time. So the love of radio, genetic in your case. Uh, and obviously, if you guys own W-E-L-Y radio, then probably the radio was on all the time, I would think, in your house. Absolutely. And the crystal radio worked really well at home. But then I took it around town and played it for others, too. To your friends? To my friends, yes. You have a father who's in the radio business. He's a broadcast engineer. The family owns a radio station in Minnesota. Do you remember your father's call sign, amateur call sign? He had a number of them along the way. The last one was W0LOJ, Loud Old Judge, but... He passed away, oh gosh, must be 15 years or more ago, 20 years, actually. And was he active up until he passed away? Yes, he was. You couldn't take the radio out of the man. That's right. <laughs> oh, that's pretty amazing. I read someplace that your father challenged your wife, that she wasn't intelligent enough to become an amateur radio operator. Did she, in fact, become an amateur radio operator? She did. And it's just to spite him, she did. And... My father was an advanced class ham at the time, which was fine with him. He didn't need to be an extra class. And my wife, being partially musical, uh, playing dulcimer and the, and the like, she succeeded in passing the 20-word-a-minute code test and then went on to pass the written. So she became an extra, just flabbergasted my father, that a woman could do such a thing. Well, good for her. And what's her call sign? Hers is uh, Whiskey Zero Hotel Alpha. So at age 10, you have this interest in shortwave radio. You're building Heath kits. Are you building Heath kits at 10 years old, 10, 11 years old? Absolutely. Over the, over the time, I think I built probably 30 of them because really I'm a hands-on guy. I'm the guy who builds and repairs rather than talks much on the radio. 
each ham has his own way of participating in the hobby, as I found out. When did you get your first license? Oh, I was 15 years old at the time, and our family moved around here to there. We had only been in Ely for five years, and by the time I was 15, uh, we were living in a suburb of Minneapolis. So that meant uh, going to St. Paul to an FCC uh, office there to take the exam. And you hear the stories about stern-faced examiners. That's exactly what I had. I mean, I filled out the paperwork, and with not even a mumble, uh, I, I was handed a uh, piece of paper to write down what I was hearing in Morse code, the five words a minute code test. And so I, I, filled, I, I copied the code, and it must have been good enough because without a word from the examiner, he shoved another piece of paper in front of me, and that was the written exam. And then when I got done writing that, I, he, he looked at the exam, and without a change in his face, he just just no motioned to the door that I was to leave. I think maybe the guy didn't know how to speak. I don't know. Anyway, the point is that that I was, oh, at least two weeks later when I received a postcard that said that I had passed. Great, I was going to be a novice, but a stern warning, you will not use your privileges until you have a call sign. Well, that took another few weeks. Actually, it started in December. So I would have been licensed in 61, but it turns out my license didn't arrive until 62, 1962, that is. And what was your novice call sign? WN0AXD. So what was your novice rig? Well, today we talk about rigs, don't we? We do. Transceivers. I like using rig because when I think of rig, I think of it's the whole geschicht, meaning it's the transmitter, it's the receiver, it's a transceiver, it's the antenna. Oh, sure. Power amplifier or whatever, what the whole rig is, kind of like a sailboat. So in your case, what did the novice rig end up becoming? Well, it was a used Johnson Viking 1 transmitter, uh, and it was wonderful at making t TV interference. It was just fabulous at doing that. Um, and I, I, my father purchased the kit to reduce or in an attempt to eliminate television interference from all the neighbors. Uh, it worked, a, worked somewhat, but not all that well. And so I didn't spend a lot of time on the air. And, well, the receiver, um, a uh, Hammerlin Super Pro, which I still have. And it has 18 tubes in it, and it still works. In fact, they pulled it out to service it the other day on the bench. Um, let's see, what was it? It was a uh, bad connection on a tube, uh, tube to a tube socket. Anyway, after that many years, things start to go wrong. Anyway, it's still a working radio. Uh, I should tell you that I, I learned um, Ohm's Law back way back when, because you needed to know that to be a ham. And anyone who doesn't know Holmes, Ohm's Law today should really study and find out what it's all about. Because back then, uh, the transmitter, as I recall, had 620 volts on the plate. And then it was capable of something like 100 watts. But as a, as a novice, I was only allowed 75 watts of power. So... I'd have to use Ohm's law to figure out how many amperes of plate current it took to get 75 watts input power, by the way. So if you take the 620 volts and you divide it by 75 watts, you wind up with 120 milliamps of current. So that's where I operated. And then you say, well, it's 75 watts. No, if you figure in the efficiency, about 70%. Now we're talking about, oh, something a little over 50 watts going into the antenna. And all of these things I learned, and it all just came together for me to understand electronics. It wasn't a mystery anymore. Were there other kids in your school that were also amateur radio operators? Did you have an amateur radio club? We did. Uh, there were a couple others. A good friend lived a few blocks away, so we communicated while I was learning my skills to do all the right things. And I remember uh, one of my first contacts uh, was with someone I wrote in my log as being Bert, B-E-R-T. Well, when the QSL card came, it was Bertha, B-E-R-T-H-A. 
So there it was. I was talking to a young lady on Morse code at the other end. So all all these things you learn along the way. I'll tell you something else I learned, too. I got a letter from the FCC, a very stern letter, that I was operating at about one kilohertz or so outside of the novice band. Now, my crystal said I was the, the, the marking on the crystal that we used. By the way, novices had to operate with crystal control to make it more stable so you didn't do the wrong thing. Well, this crystal was mislabeled. So I took the crystal apart. You could do that back then, uh, unscrew that, and then, uh, then very carefully, slightly sand down this, this uh, silicon rock on the inside until I got it to move inside of the novice band. Now, try that today. But these are all learning experiences that paid out well for my later work as a broadcast engineer. Did ham radio play a part in the choices that you made for your education and career? I mean, did you plan that you would continue on? Actually, amateur radio is a part of it. I knew from a very young age, probably from age 10, that I was going to be a broadcast engineer. And in order to be a broadcast engineer, I should be a ham at the same time. So uh, my entire life was dedicated to one thing. Unlike many people who hold, who have held, you know, diverse jobs, I always knew that I was going to do this. I was just going to do, and radio, not necessarily television. I had chosen that as a youngster. And now this message from ICOM America. ICOM wants to wish you a happy new year. If Santa confused your wish list with that of someone else's, and a new battery-powered weed whacker is displayed under your tree, then it's not too late to return the mistake and head to your favorite ham radio dealer for one or all of the latest ICOM transceivers. The ICOM IC705 is the perfect sidekick and QRP companion with base station features and functionality at the tip of your fingers in a portable package covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in at just over 2 pounds, with RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 megahertz. It has become the go-to baseband rig for microwave operators. Its features include a 4.3-inch touchscreen display with a live band scope and waterfall, 5 watts with a BP272 battery pack, and 10 watts with a 13.8 DC power supply, single sideband CW, AM, FM, as well as full D-Star functions, a micro USB connector, Bluetooth, and wireless LAN, integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger, a micro SD card slot, the HM243 microphone speaker is included, and it supports QRP and QRPP operations. The perfect accessory for the ICOM 705 is the optional LC192 backpack. The LC192 includes a special compartment for your IC705 and additional room for accessories. The ICOM ID52A is a VHF-UHF dual-band handheld portable transceiver with D-Star and FM dual-mode functions and is the first handheld amateur radio with a full-color 2.3-inch waterfall display. This portable supports conventional FM communications and D-Star simplex, repeater, regional, worldwide calls over the D-Star Internet Gateway. You can even send photos over D-Star using your connected Android device. Other ID52 features include a wideband receiver with guaranteed range of 144 to 148 MHz and 440 to 450 MHz, VVUUVU with dual DV mode, integrated GPS GLONASS receiver including grid square location, micro SD card slot, micro USB for data transfer, programming, and charging, and of course, it is in an IPX7 waterproof case. The ID52A is the perfect companion to the IC705 as both use batteries, headsets, and the same Android app for D-Star operation. 
create your own band opening with the ICOM IC9700. This transceiver brings direct sampling to the UHF-VHF weak signal world and is loaded with innovative features that are sure to keep you busy, including faster processors, higher input gain, higher display resolution, and a cleaner signal. More features include a 4.3-inch touchscreen color TFT LCD with real-time high-speed spectrum scope and waterfall display, smooth satellite operation with 99 satellite channels, dual watch operation, and full duplex operation in satellite mode. The ICOM IC7300 is a high-performance HF transceiver with a compact design that will far exceed everyone's expectations. This transceiver digitizes RF before various receiver stages, reducing inherent noise in different IF stages. The IC7300 changed the way entry-level HF is designed. The ICOM IC7300 features include RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, and an SD memory card slot. This radio by far is the best HF rig that I have ever owned. I love it for its features and value. When it comes to amateur radio operators justifying a new transceiver purchase, Santa's confusion is one of the best explanations to your significant other, that you're only correcting Santa's embarrassing mistake. 2023 is just beginning, and there's no reason not to enjoy a single day of the new year operating your new ICOM transceiver. Head out to your ICOM dealer today to purchase your new ICOM rig. Be sure to tell your dealer that you heard about it here on QSO Today. And now back to our QSO. So after high school, did you head to broadcast engineering school? No, I didn't, because I, I got all that education at home. In fact, even before I left high school, our family was building yet another radio station, KVBR, in Brainerd, Minnesota. 1,000 watts on 1340 AM. And at age, I don't know, 15, 16, I was in Brainerd. We actually weren't living there at the time, but we were partial owners of it. I uh, I was there, and I wired the place. The equipment had been set in place waiting for me to come by. And it just was all very natural to connect the microphones and uh, all the tape equipment and the transmitter to its remote control, all of the above, it just flowed, and it was a wonderful experience. Did you have a FCC license for broadcasting? Not at that moment. And uh, what I did, uh, well, let's see, when I was more like 17 or 18, went to the FCC office in St. Paul and took the exams. So it was the third class operators, the second class, then the first class with radar endorsement. Actually, I did the radar endorsement thing after I had been teaching electronics in the U.S. Army at Fort Monmouth. And one of the subjects there was teaching radar. So it was a slam dunk deal to pass the exam for the first class with its uh, radar endorsement. After high school, after you've had this experience at KVBR, what happened after that? Well... I took a year of college and absolutely hated it. They didn't talk about one thing about electronics. All they talked about is, I don't know, even remember. So I'm a very patriotic person, and so I signed up to go in the Army. And I wound up uh, teaching, as I mentioned, electronics at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. And as it turns out, gosh, I was born at the right or wrong time. It was during the Vietnam War. And like almost everyone, they needed uh, they, they, the Army needed people, and they cycled them through Vietnam. So I wound up spending a year there doing high-tech electronic repair. Fortunately, I didn't have to go out in the field and look for the Viet Cong. But um, it, was, um, it, was a, it was quite an experience. And the electronic repair was on the uh, OV-1 Mohawk, a high-tech surveillance airplane, twin 1,400-horse uh, turboprop uh, engines, and it carried uh, high-tech surveillance cameras and radar, side-looking radar that could peer into the jungles and see movement even below the canopy of the jungles. Amazing technology, especially for the time. So do you think that your professional experience, your technical experience uh, growing up 
with a broadcast engineer and then becoming one yourself, that kind of took you out of the infantry and made sure that you were in a technical position in the Army, especially during a draft that was very aggressive in terms of wanting infantrymen. As it turns out, if I had been drafted, I would have been in infantry, which is definitely not my thing. So I was promised an electronics MOS if I signed up for three years rather than being drafted for two years. And it worked out. Now I find out that people were promised things that they never have, that they never got. So they might have ended up in the jungles of Vietnam, even with an enlistment. It could have happened, but fortunately it didn't. And they needed technical people so badly that I remember working 12 hours a day, seven days a week, keeping this equipment in repair because we're talking about uh, you know, extremely high humidity conditions, hard on electronic contacts and everything else. Keeping this equipment going was a full-time job. And there were so few technical people that I just had to just work. And besides, there was no, no place to go, nothing to do. It wasn't like Saigon. It was a small air base. Did you have a chance to operate ham radio from there? Did you operate Army Mars? No, I didn't. I was just so busy, and I was, uh, it just didn't happen. I, I wish I had looked for it, but I don't even know if it was there. So when you returned from Vietnam, came back to the States, you're now a civilian. What happened after that? Oh, well, my, my folks had, uh, had uh, taken over WEL. No, no, no. Uh, they took over KVBR, Radio and Brainerd. So I came back, and I was an engineer there did a little bit of air work, but really I was heading to help other stations. So I, I was going around the state and earning money from other stations where engineers were being let go because the FCC was uh, deregulating the requirement for a first-class uh, radio ticket for an engineer on site at every radio station. So they let those guys go or they died. And then I was the guy to go and keep the transmitters running. It used to be that there had to be a licensed engineer on site as long as that transmitter was transmitting. And then they softened the regulation. So then engineer just had to come and sign the log on a regular basis. Some of that. It was it was a multi-tiered approach along the way. Uh, You had a chief operator that had to sign the logs, and all that person had to do was have a third-class license. And for a while, they still required first-class engineers to operate directional AMs. Many AM radio stations have non-directional patterns during the day, and then so the lower license was okay. But if it be, if uh, but at night the stations might go directional to protect other stations on the same frequency, and therefore uh, it, the FCC was requiring a first class license, someone who is supposed to know how these things work and understand when there are problems what to do. So that meant that a single first class engineer then could actually support a number of stations, not just one station. I guess it came down that way, but when I got into doing it full-time, usually there was a full-time person at a radio station. It evolved into a an engineer handling six or even a dozen radio stations, and then, then the FCC licenses completely were, um, were set aside as not needed anymore. It actually turned into what's called general class, but uh, even that became a moot point with deregulation. Do you think that that made the business, the broadcast industry, safer? If you've got a 500,000-watt AM transmitter or you've got a 25,000-watt FM transmitter or something like that, it seems to me that there's some potentially hazardous work for somebody who's not licensed. Did the equipment change? What was the change that seemed to make that okay? Well, The equipment manufacturers started to build a lot of safety features into transmitters, interlocks, and all that kind of thing. And the FCC came down with rules about uh, you've got to keep, you've got to protect the high voltages so they don't, uh, they're not exposing anyone. And then there was the RF radiation thing where, where sites had to be determined to be safe from, for visitors and, which is a, Uh, more stringent requirement than actually people working there, and documentation had to be made to make that happen. 
uh, using uh, oh, an RF radiation meter, that kind of thing. So it got better, but the manufacturers more recently have designed transmitters with uh, user interfaces that connect to the Internet. So when something goes wrong with a transmitter, oftentimes the transmitter manufacturer is the first one to know that a module has failed. So the, <laughs> the manager of the radio station, because they might not have an engineer, will get an email saying module number five failed, but the others are still working and we're sending you another one under warranty or if you'd like to pay X many bucks, we'll swap the module for you or we'll send you a module which you can plug in safely. What hot, can you believe that? While the transmitter's running and to restore the transmitter to full power. And what do you think about that in terms of being professional broadcast engineer and being the son of a professional broadcast engineer. Do you think that ultimately that's good for the business? Do you think that broadcast engineers aren't needed anymore? Oh, it's good for the business because I'll tell you quite frankly, many radio broadcast engineers don't understand Ohm's law. They are they just show up and 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 they just they just do things because there's no training out there. There used to be training broadcast engineers, uh, Cleveland Institute of Electronics, that kind of thing. And the Society of Broadcast Engineers right now is picking up the slack. They're, they're, they're working on training programs, and then they have the mentor-mentee programs, of which I am a mentor of four or five broadcast engineers. And they call me and they say, I got this situation, what should I do? And uh, if they're local, then I go out to lunch with them. They buy me lunch, and I give them the answers. But I do warn them that don't call me if it's if it, if it's outside of the eight to five Monday through Friday time. But I am mentoring these people, and gosh, teaching them Ohm's law when they should know it already. Are there still either operations or tests that somebody at your level still needs to do for, say, a directional AM station, if those exist anymore? And, I mean, even though you're retired, it seems to me, are there still opportunities for retired broadcast engineers to continue to do some consulting? Mm. Well, tests, uh, certification for anything in broadcast uh, has gone by the wayside. So the owner of the facility, usually a corporation, is the one responsible if something goes wrong. So the FCC has put that on the shoulders of the owner not the FCC's responsibility to determine if it's being done right. So if something's being done wrong, and it seems to me with the listening posts that used to be all over America that the FCC operated, if there's a problem with a broadcast station, then that problem may only be evident to listeners, or it may not even be evident to the station owner until there's some complaint. Yes, and the FCC uh, is supposed to go out and uh, inspect radio stations, but they're Load has been lessened through a program called, um, oh, it's mock inspections. So a state broadcasters association will have someone who goes around and inspects a station for all of the required uh, things they're supposed to have, the emergency uh, alert system, all the paperwork in the files, are the transmitters running at the licensed power, et cetera, et cetera. And they'll get a certificate that's good for three years that says, uh, they're good, and so an FCC inspector will not come around when the, when one of those when that paperwork is good for three years, except if there is a complaint. And when the FCC gets a complaint, they will they will send a letter to the broadcaster saying, "Fix this complaint and let us know." And if the complaint isn't satisfied, then the inspector will show up. So the FCC doesn't have to work as hard as they used to, and they have a lot fewer inspectors, too. I want to take a minute to tell you about my favorite podcast, the Ham Radio Workbench Podcast with George, KJ6VU, and now joined by Rod, VA3ON, Mike, VA3MW, Mark, N6MTS, and Vince, VE6LK. Every two weeks, George and company offer up a status report on the many amateur radio projects on their workbenches and explore projects on their guests' workbenches. 
This group is project active and prolific, covering many technical areas of amateur radio. So the next time you want a deep dive into ham radio electronic project building, or to learn about technology, tools, test equipment, construction techniques, and the rest, listen to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast available on every podcast player and channel. Use the link in this week's show notes page to get to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast directly. And now back to my QSO. You actually have received two awards from the Society of Broadcast Engineers. Once in 2018, you received the Engineer of the Year Award, and you've also received the Lifetime Achievement Award. It seems to me that with everything that you're saying, that the Society of Broadcast Engineers has changed or its role is changing. And can you talk about the significance of those awards as well as the organization itself? Well, thank you for asking. Uh, they're they're trying to raise the level of competence in the broadcast engineering field, and of course, like any organization, they like they like to have more members and all that kind of thing. So you have certifications within that, and all oh, by the way, that uh, lifetime achievement award. Surprisingly, I was only the tenth recipient in fifty four years in the organization's lifetime getting that award. Because most people just kind of go through their life and they're an engineer for a while and then they maybe there's something else and then they retire. But it's the achievements that happen along the way. In my case, I built 12 new radio broadcast stations and that kind of clued me into that. And then um, I, was, uh, I was an installer for uh, Motorola installing AM stereo. Uh, who knows about AM stereo? Now, there's a technology that could have and would have succeeded, except it came along too late, about the time that radio, AM radio, that is, was being converted over to talk radio. Only good for politicians who talk out of both sides of their mouths. I have to say, I love talk radio in all its forms. I was weaned on talk radio in the 60s and 70s. I'm sorry to hear that all around the world, it seems to me, AM stations are being shut down. Maybe because it costs a lot of money when you can actually put something out like a podcast like we're doing right now on the Internet for a fraction of the cost. So that was the reason then that AM stereo never took over because most of the music was on FM. That's right. Um, Actually, it was a two-tiered approach. The FCC was looking at five possible candidates for AM stereo, all of them very similar but different from each other. And they said, let the marketplace decide. And I knew instantly when they came out with that ruling that that was not going to work. And it didn't. There was a lot of havoc. Some installed one system, some installed another. And in the end, the Congress required the FCC to actually choose a standard, which they did, but it was too late. And uh, regarding cost of operation, AM radio cost more to keep it running because of the time in maintenance to keep it going than FM radio. So AM radio is, is just taking a hit all the way around here. Right. You've got real estate. AM antennas are large. You have real estate to deal with. You've got electric power. If you're running uh, 100,000 watts, well, actually, 50,000 watts is maximum for transmitter power on AM. I'm thinking um, shortwave broadcast stations can operate more. Yes. Typically, they're in the 100 kilowatt class, but I think there are more. But even 50,000 watts is quite a lot of power. You could have quite an electric bill from an AM station. Yes. Now, you hear about FM stations being 100,000 watts. Well, they're really not. What it is is like a 25,000-watt transmitter feeding an antenna that has gain. So it's vertically stacked dipoles, cross dipoles, maybe 10 of them high on a tower, one wavelength apart. And in the FM band, that's about 10 feet per spacing per bay. So it's 100 feet of height. You see all these cross dipoles on towers like that. That's an FM radio station. It'll have a gain of five, maybe. Okay, so therefore they get their 100,000 watts. I mentioned earlier that you're a contributor of articles to radio magazines. Those magazines include but are not limited to Radio World, CQ Magazine, and QST. How and why did you start becoming a writer, a regular contributor to these magazines? Well, I've always been a storyteller, so and I like to share my knowledge. I, I, I don't keep it to myself. 
it's fun to 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 help others. I, I've always been that way. I, it just kind of worked out. So I enjoy writing, and and um, it's been it's been fun. And and I do that for some of my website writing as well, which is another hobby I have. But we don't need to go there right now. Radio World appears to me because I've never actually heard of it before until I opened it up. That appears to be a commercial magazine for the industry. It's actually for broadcast engineers, Radio World. And is it a Society of Broadcast Engineers magazine? No, it is not. It's a private magazine. That is correct. It's a commercial magazine supported by advertising. And that actually looks like it has some very interesting articles. So I, I've marked it for my own amusement. But what subjects did you like to write on the most when you were writing for Radio World, for example? Well, usually it has to do with transmitters and antennas, but recently, oh, in, in the last year, I wrote an article called Ham versus uh, Broadcast, and I showed the differences and the similarities. Well, the similarities are Ohm's Law. We all make electronics go in the same way. The differences were just amazing. Hams operate on about any frequency within any, within any uh, the bands. Broadcasters are required to be exactly on frequency, and the amount of power has to be exactly right, uh, at least above 90% and below 105% of the licensed value. So those are just some of the differences. Um, ha uh, broadcast IDs on the hour, uh, hams every 10 minutes, as we all know. It's um, it, And the interesting part is that there was a lot of reaction to that article, because it, um, because some <clears throat> broadcast engineers today, and especially the older ones, loved to to compare broadcasting with ham radio, and I did it in a very favorable way. Do you think that there are opportunities for young people in the broadcast industry now? There certainly are, and the broadcast industry is just screaming for young people to get in. It, but who wants to work, uh, in essence, be on call 24-7 for a, an average salary? I mean, the person who is going to be a broadcast engineer has to love radio and love going out in the middle of the night and working on transmitters to get that good feeling that I did something right today. I hate to say this, Mark, but that seems to be kind of an old-fashioned value. It certainly is. I think I read some statistic today that perhaps 7 to 8 million college graduate kids are moving back into their parents' homes this year. It seems to me that's kind of an old-fashioned value. On the one hand, it also means it seems to me that to fill this role that you actually have to have more than Ohm's Law. You might actually have to have some hands-on technical knowledge to be able to be the self-starter in a broadcast station. Well, and ham radio really applied well because as a ham, I knew about how wave propagation works on different bands, 160 meters through two meters, that kind of thing. And, and it all flowed knowing that while well, the 160 meter kind of propagation we get applies to AM radio because it's right next to the AM radio band. And then two meters, well, that's right next to the FM three meter band. So we learn about that. And then microwave at uh, 950 megahertz delivering audio from a studio to a transmitter site, uh, that has its own set of propagation rules and anomalies. So, uh, But it, 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 um, it just flowed for me to take my ham knowledge and use it in the broadcast world and vice versa. I'm always trying to figure out what's an angle that we could use in order to attract young people to ham radio. And so I hope you don't mind me going down this rabbit hole with you. But do you think that there's a role then for amateur radio to play in terms of preparing young people for professions in broadcast radio and television? Yes, but it doesn't seem to be happening. I mean, what I see with young people is they want to be information technology, IT people. And the broadcast industry has come down to hiring IT people, which they need, but also trying to get them to go out to the transmitter and figure out what the heck went wrong. And so 
that's that's a really tough uh, tough thing, and that's where the Society of Broadcast Engineers is coming in, trying to train IT people to be RF people too. So could that be a professional specialty, and therefore maybe worth more money? There isn't as much money in broadcast as we'd like to have. It's become such a competitive medium that. You know, a good IT person can do better there than he'll ever do or she will ever do in broadcast. And is that because we have this idea that perhaps at some point terrestrial radio, AM and FM radios that have been broadcasting for now almost 100 years, that these are passe and that all of our broadcasting could go to IP infrastructure? I'm seeing that as a very distinct possibility. Now, the number of AM radio stations today is five or more percent less than it was 10 years ago. They are being turned off, and that, uh, uh, AMs, that is. FMs, the numbers are still increasing. Uh, the FCC allowed AMs to have FM translators that operate up to 250 watts. I think it was a mistake on the part of the FCC, but that's my personal opinion. Are you saying that the increase in the number of FM transmitters, is that because they're now talking lower power, higher density? Well, they're filling all the spots on the FM dial. Everyone wants to be on the FM dial, and the AMs being more expensive to maintain are being turned off. It's interesting from what you're saying. You see more and more people, I do anyway, I'm listening on my phone in the car to podcasts or Spotify. So I don't even think I turn on my radio anymore in the FM band or the AM band, for that matter. So it's interesting that there's this competition for spots. At the same time, there may be competition for music or talk sources that are coming from other places. That's so interesting. I had no idea that was happening. Well, that's an interesting point. In fact, I should be addressing that. I I ran into someone who has a Tesla the other day, and I said, does it have an AM radio? I don't know. Does it? Have, well, how does it sound on FM? I don't know. Well, the answer was... It's all about uh, podcast and streaming music, that kind of thing. So that really is the trend of the future, and it doesn't bode well for broadcast. But think of it this way. Nothing can continue forever. I mean, we had uh, buggy whip manufacturers from the last century. Well, they went out of business. So eventually, radio broadcasting may go away ham radio there's no reason why it can't continue and by the way in europe they're even turning they've turned off all the am radio stations outside of high power short wave jobs and then fm radio is being turned off left and right in europe as well the, the only the real only real holdout is in the us and and other countries like india are moving over to digital transmissions that require new receivers but uh, can get the job done very nicely. We will return to our guests in just a moment. Nuts and Volts Magazine is a new sponsor and is an amazing resource for new and old hams alike. Click on the banner to get your online or paper subscription of Nuts and Volts. A new way to show your support of the QSO Today podcast is to buy me a coffee. I consume gallons of coffee to create this weekly podcast. Invite me for coffee by pushing the yellow button, buy me a coffee, on the QSO Today show notes page. And now, back to our QSO Today. I saw that in Radio World when I was researching this episode with you. There's actually an article about FM transmitters being taken down in Europe. For the listeners, we will talk about amateur radio. Mark, what is your favorite operating mode? Oh, well... Even though I know CW, it's it's cumbersome, and with uh, some hearing problems I have, I've, I've, I'm on um, uh, sideband. So I love getting together with uh, Quarter Century Wireless Association on Saturday mornings in the Midwest, uh, five-state area on 3908 kilohertz. And then I really like to do special events because the people on the other end are, are kind of hyped up want to talk about the you know everything and this last week i talked to k5a in arkansas their thing was special event for the last lunar landing uh let's see quarter century wireless had a uh a 75th anniversary so if you're on the ham dials anywhere and you you hear w2mm or w1mm any of the numbers 
that's that has to do with uh, quarter century wireless. Then yesterday, I was tuning around on 20 meters looking for, uh, and I found a special event in, um, oh, let's see, oh, oh, Cape Kennedy. It was N1KSC K- Kennedy Space Center. They were talking about uh, the um, Orion flight. Remember this um, unmanned flight that went around the moon? I think it just splashed down, right? They had dummies in the... Is that what they had? They had dummies in the seats? I think they had dummies in the seats, yeah. Oh, jeez. Okay. Well, we won't comment about how it happens when, they're, when their blood is flowing either, but that's another story. But, but the, interestingly enough, I got done talking uh, with them, and the, it was nice, QSO, because it lasted a couple minutes talking about the weather and everything. And then uh, they talked to one other station, and following that, the operator said, well, we have to sign off now. Uh, Orion is just about ready to splash down. So, boom, I was over to uh, NASA TV on my computer and saw the whole thing. It was great. You know, it's amazing. On the other hand, 50 years ago, I remember actually seeing men walking on the moon. I remember that, too. What a great time. What a great time on the one hand, but it seems to me 50 years later, they're sending dummies around the moon rather than putting people back on the moon. What can I tell you? Let me ask you another question, and that is I read something that when you and your wife designed the house that you're in now, that you actually decided to wire your house like a broadcast facility. What does that mean? Well, first of all, at least in Minnesota, homeowners are allowed to do their own wiring, assuming it gets inspected. But I wanted to build this uh, as a uh, as a ham facility, and it, it got built uh, it, like a broadcast facility, keeping in mind all of the right ways and wrong ways to do things. My big thing about building, and I could do it from the ground up, was single point ground. All the cabling coming into and out of the house had to come by one panel four feet wide. It had to, And it had to go to a common ground at that point and a copper strap because that's what we do in broadcast. You'll see some of that on uh, that episode on QSO today. And um, if you could provide a link to that, you could probably... I will do that in the show notes page. Anyway, so since I've always enjoyed working with wires, we wired the place. And the surprising thing is that it came out with nine electrical panels, not just one, because there was uh, off-peak power involved and a full automatic whole house backup generator plant, which is something that uh, we built into broadcast facility. So... The power goes out, we only lose it for 10 seconds, and then all is well after that. You're doing that with a gas generator, or are you doing that with batteries in a gas generator? It's with uh, propane-powered 22-kilowatt Kohler. It's a Ford four-cylinder engine in a housing that uh, run, runs on propane. So, uh, And then, uh, as far as batteries go, we have one inter- uninterruptible power supply. And that took up the the last of the of the electrical panels basically it's a rack mounted 3kw ups and with external batteries and its job is to keep all of the computers alarm systems everything running during the time it takes for the generator to come online 10 seconds later oh, i see okay so your electronics is protected yes with the ups while the generator is coming up yeah and the computers are not it, at that room, there it's separate wiring running out to the office desks and the shop and all the other locations that need UPS power. Oh, that's amazing. Separate outlets for that power. So that means then that if you're running antennas through the bulkhead to the outside, antenna cables, you're not grounding those at that point? Well, there are surge protectors that are screwed down to that copper strap single point ground for every cable, well, every coaxial cable that goes out. And on the outside side of that screwed down protector is two or three or more turns of coaxial cable. So if lightning wants to come in on that cable, at first it has to go through those turns even before it gets to the surge protector that takes the shield of the cable and hooks it right to ground at that point. And it has a gas tube 
to protect the inside with a few hundred volts, whatever it turns out to be, to the outside. Okay, so I'm imagining for me, and I'm hoping that that the listeners were also imagining for them, I've got that same, where the electricity enters my house, one floor up and in the front of the house. I happen to be, my ham station is one floor down on the back of the house. We have that copper strap. That copper strap goes under the garden in the front. That's what kind of makes this ground that we have. And then, of course, we've got ground wires that run throughout all the outlets in the house. But outside my office, I go through the wall, I go into surge protectors, but those surge protectors are going to a ground rod under it. That means that there must be difference of potential between the house ground and my ground rod. Is that right? Yeah, very common problem. And in broadcast, we learned never to let that happen. You have a single ground. And quite frankly, the cable from your antennas should not go directly to your ham shack. It should go to the single point ground with the electrical panel where the real ground rod is, or in my case, multiple from that panel. Uh, it should run by there, go over to a surge protector, and then run to your ham shack. Because if you don't do that, and if, if your antenna does get hit by lightning, the lightning will come in and it will go through your ham equipment on its way to the other ground. So your, your equipment winds up toasted like a fuse in the path of the lightning. Right, except that that ground on the other side of the house has a, a house in front of it. So I'm in a townhouse. Fortunately, all the townhouses here are made of poured concrete and cement and steel rebar. But that ground is on the front of the house, and the ham shack and the antennas are on the back of the house. How does one solve a problem like that? Do I have to look at figuring out how to bond those grounds together? Well, first, the, the, the would be the right thing to bond them together. But even better, you add more coaxial cable. You bring your antenna line all, all the way to the common point ground and then bring it back again, which means additional loss. But the potential of a lightning hit is much uh, causing damage. It's much, much less. Because when, you, when, when everything comes out of that single point ground, lightning has no reason to go to your equipment because there's no ground on the far side. Yeah, well, since since you already have the ground rod, take a number six stranded and hook onto the ground rod and run it to the other ground rod, which is at the common sen- uh, single point ground at your electrical panel. So it has an additional place to find ground, but that's from that's from the common ground at the electrical panel, and then but make sh- and but. Uh, Let's see, but don't hook your coaxial cable on that extra ground rod at your shack. Just, um, but run your cable over to that surge protector at the single point ground and run it back to your shack. Well, it sounds to me, Mark, you've convinced me that I need to actually find a mentor to actually understand this better, even for me. The way that they do this here in Israel is very different than what they do in America. I'm sitting on top of a limestone cliff as well. So not only am I in a poured concrete building, it's all kind of messed up. I probably need some professional eyeballs looking at what I'm doing here to make sure that I don't burn up everything in the house when I get hit by lightning. Ooh. Well, just do your research and the uh, look at the presentation I did uh, from QSO today. And there, are, there is a schematic diagram of the right and wrong ways to do that. Okay, good. I really appreciate that. And of course... I'm urging all of the listeners to also have a chance to look at that as well. You have a very impressive workbench in your house as well. I mean, your shack is very impressive, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But what is today's project on your impressive workbench? Oh, let me see. I think I cleared. What did I just finish working on? Uh, You see, as a retired guy and not being insured, I can't do anything on my workbench and charge for it. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm in the mentor mode. What I use my workbench for right now is in my uh, uh, writing for Radio World and, and for uh, my ham radio gear, and I help other hams with, uh, with their stuff. What was it I did the other day? Well, it's, it's, it's always something coming and going. But the point is that I maintain the workbench, and it's not in the garage. It's in the house, okay? Um, 
I learned that as a little kid that that in order to get you have to have a good atmosphere. You need good lighting. You need the right temperature. I live in Minnesota. I don't operate out of the garage. Okay, I I have it. It's just like a part of the house. And there's a couple thousand square feet here of doing just that. Well, it's our office, and uh, which we still maintain uh, because it's just a wonderful environment for Paula and I where we actually have two desks that face each other, which is another story unto itself. But um, uh, workshop is just a logical place. People, my friend, ham friends come over and they plunk something on the bench and they say, I got a problem. And uh, we go through it and I show them how to repair their own gear. Now, if it's more real current stuff, with that uh, that's made in the last 10 years it's impractical to do that but if it's older than that uh fine so what was on my bench the other day my um my linear amplifier my uh, my ameritron al 80b i was on um, on the net the other day and after i released the transmit button i couldn't hear anybody or just barely could hear someone well what was that well it was a bad transmit receive relay in the amplifier, it uh, it's it's the the, rec- the contacts on the receive side open. Well, they had enough corrosion on them, so that meant opening it up and servicing it and putting it back, and all is well again. What would what would the average Joe do if he if he if he somehow figured out that the linear amplifier was the reason why he couldn't hear anymore on his radio? Well, he might look at the TR relay. Yeah, yeah. Are you suggesting that perhaps the average show wouldn't know that? Might not. It might need a mentor, an Elmer, to come over and help him out. I think that there's no price you can put on an Elmer, in my opinion. Don't you think? Oh, I, I think so. I've done that before. And it feels so good to do that. And, of course, I don't charge a dime. That's the wrong thing to do. It feels so good to help. Are you still building kits? Uh, no. But uh, along the way, I've designed and built hundreds of small projects for broadcast facilities. Every time you turned around, someone needed a special something or other. And so I just built them, and, and it just all made sense. Would you design with a CAD software, or would you draw it by hand and lay it out with tape? What was your method? Just draw schematics by hand. Just uh, make it all happen, especially if it's a one-time deal. But, I mean, I was building these really neat antenna switches, which used a 30-amp regular 240-volt relay that you could buy at, uh, at Home Depot, I think. Just a standard 120 240-volt relay. And it made a wonderful transmitter auxiliary dummy load antenna switch, four-port switch. Either the transmitter is feeding the antenna and the dummy is connected to the auxiliary transmitter, or the dummy is connected to the main transmitter and the auxiliary is connected to the antenna. Or in the case of ham radio, I use, and you'll see it in that presentation, a switch that, uh, that, that has me using my, uh, my MFJ antenna analyzer looking at the antenna. And so... I flip a switch and the relay pulls in and it connects my analyzer to the antenna and the the transceiver is connected to my dummy load. So if I want to do some testing into the dummy load, it's I don't have to wire it. It just happens through this relay. Once I've determined that the antenna is good to transmit at, and I do that every time I, before I go on the air, I check it on the frequency I'm going to use and I've got oh, I don't know, five antennas, something like that, then I know that I can push the transmit button when the time is right and all will be well into uh, the antenna. I won't wind up with arcs and sparks because, gosh, uh, one part of a dipole fell down or a wire came loose or something like that. I can transmit with confidence. And all that just by using one of these relays in a metal box so it's RF safe. And what is the current rig? Oh, and I come 7300, love it, and um, <clears throat> the Ameritron AL80B for close to 1,000 watts when I'm transmitting on sideband. And what does Paula like to operate? Oh, she likes to do special events. So 
it, it's it, it uh, so she'll operate two meters and get this she, it, she works uh, with a project at the arboretum called the haunted trail I think it's called and so some of the operators are ham radio some of them don't have license so she'll have a handheld radio in each hand one a two meter and the other one for family radio service whatever it is she's in the middle of these conversations relaying messages and occasionally she'll use her call sign on the family radio service radio by accident it's just comical and they say what was that you live in minnesota isn't minnesota the state of a thousand lakes ten thousand lakes actually ten thousand lakes there are more than that actually ours is a 360 acre lake so it's not that big we can cruise around it in less than an hour and on your rig at your house there at gilbert lake what kind of antenna system do you have there? Well, I never really got into beam antennas, but I do have, oh, an 80-meter dipole, a 20-meter uh, inverted V at 65 feet, which works out really well because that's one wavelength above the ground. Think in those terms when you have antennas, wavelengths, that kind of thing. Uh, there's the Cushcraft R5 vertical. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, I've got a uh, two meter four forty vertical at the top of the tower, and then and then uh, what turns out to be um, an all band antenna. It's a couple hundred feet long, kind of in an L shape because of the property, but it's my one sixty through whatever antenna, and it's fed by a ladder line in the middle. And the interesting part is that you think about stringing it from tree to tree. Well, a friend of mine, whom I refer to as Robin Hood, came over with his uh, bow and arrow, and his thing was, you string the wires across the tops of the trees. So we managed to make it at the at the crest of the trees, which I thought was a pretty good idea. And you don't climb up there, you use your bow and arrow to string the wire. It worked great. So, And that one, of course, has to have a tuner on it. And uh, and so it uh, it it works well on all the bands that I don't have a dipole for. And obviously, you don't have a shortage of trees. Oh, in Minnesota, there we always have plenty. What do you think the greatest challenge facing amateur radio is now? Uh, bringing people into the hobby. I, I I just don't see the interest there. Interestingly enough, uh, neighbor kids came over oh, a while back, and I said, "This is amateur radio." And I made contact with a Route 66 station on 20 meters. And I said, hey, isn't that great? And their only question was, what's Route 66? Yeah, there you go. They had no interest in the radio because they have their smartphones. So I, I think that's a real challenge. But, you know, learning and doing things is something that seems to have fallen out of fashion in America. So maybe there's some projects that might interest kids. I've heard that the maker fairs seem to attract kids in terms of getting their hands dirty. Oh, okay. Well, good. And I guess my advice to anyone who does get a license is don't just get the license and do nothing, which seems like a common thing nowadays. Do something. Go find a tube radio, probably a radio or transmitter, as in tubes, and take it apart and restore it and learn something about what makes these things go so that you can you can be uh, more than just a ham. You can maybe even use these radios on the air with great pride. And where would someone find a tube transmitter? If you were advising a new licensee in your shop? Yeah, there are ham fests everywhere. I, I'm really, uh, really enjoying going to ham fests. R don't usually buy much because I've got trying to get rid of things, but... The stuff's available out there, and learn learn these things. Get it, learn what an oscilloscope is. To me, that's just a standard tool like a voltmeter, and it tells me so much, and and it's so revealing. And I'm having to teach broadcast engineers, new ones, what an oscilloscope is and how it works. But to me, it's just standard issue equipment. But would a new engineer actually use one? Oh, absolutely. Let's say you go out to an AM radio station, uh, a transmitter, and you are going to set modulation. Well, a mo we, there are modulation monitors, if they still have them. Used to be required, not anymore. 
But putting uh, an oscilloscope on a sample port on the transmitter, you can see the AM modulation depressing to zero watts at 100% negative modulation and then peaking to 100% positive. All that just is so visually right. You already gave me the advice you'd give to newer returning hams. What excites you the most about what's happening in amateur radio now? Oh, I just love the camaraderie of talking to other people. It's like having uh, breakfast or coffee with guys on a Saturday morning, and it, it we have a nice exchange of passing ideas around and learning things. That that's I really look forward to that. And then, of course, there's the, uh, as I mentioned, the special events. It's just fun to to be a part of something special like that. Mark, I want to thank you so much for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. With that, I want to thank you so much and wish you 73. 73s, 4Z1UG, it's W0, Mike Hotel. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope you enjoyed this QSO with Mark. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in W0MH in the search box at the top of the page. My thanks to ICOM America for their continued support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of this fine sponsor by clicking on their link in the show notes pages. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any of the other episodes into written text, click on the transcribe button at the top of the show notes page. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes page. By using the Amazon link on the home page before you shop at Amazon allows Amazon to send us a small commission on what you purchase that further keeps our QSO Today project going. I am grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference as we work towards episode 500. QSO Today is now available on a large number of podcast players and now a host of podcast services and applications. We are Podcast 2.0 compatible. I now use the Fountain Podcast Player to listen to all of my favorite podcasts. Until next time, this is Eric for Z1UG 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.